Kia ora koutou katoa. Can you hear me, everyone? Great. We are <laughs> on to the last panel for the day, at least uh, the last panel for us here in Elk Teroa. And uh, a really powerful panel that is close to uh, the heart of the cop up of the culture centered approach and the work of uh, care. Uh, we have with us three amazing uh, presenters who really have put their bodies on the line um, in different contexts engaging with the question of trauma. So, this particular panel is uh, titled Trauma and Method in the Global South. And we have with us today. Uh, Francine Whitfield, Mabubo Rahman, and the uh, Pitaloka. We will uh, start with the first prompt of the day, uh, which is uh, what are the interplays of method and trauma in the Global South? And we will begin with you, Francine. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, good afternoon, good morning around the world. Um, my name is Francine Whitfield, and I've been involved with CARE for the last six months as an intern. While at CARE, I've been undertaking the roles of supporting our research team, conducting interviews, transcribing, and managing demographics of our participants. I will speak in reference to my work at CARE, researching community solutions to sexual and family violence. So I see the Global South as giving reference to people at the margins of society. These people in New Zealand could be below the poverty line Māori persecuted by the government and experiencing racism through inequitable structures built in New Zealand. Migrants escaping persecution from their homelands, finding refuge in New Zealand, and transsexual men and women. What we've found is marginalised people in New Zealand are not often given a voice, which limits their power and their control to better their lives and further act sorry, further being an act of violence upon themselves. While completing research into community solutions to sexual and family violence, the research <laughs> team have experienced the attempts at erasure of voice, witnessing attempts of erasure inflicted on our community researchers, and the silencing of the voice and the narratives that are brought through from our participants we have um, conducted interviews with. We've heard comments by those with power and have, that have silenced the voice of the community. This process of gaslighting, where they community, stating comments such as community do not have the ability to develop and carry out their own solutions is an act of violence in an attempt at erasure of voice and further marginalises those people already at the margins of the margins of society. So I'd like to just um, end there and thank you. Good morning and good afternoon throughout the world. I have been working with CARE for more than one year and I have been dealing with, I think, the most traumatized people of Global South, that is the Rohingya refugees living in outer New Zealand. While working with traumatized Global South Rohingya people, it is observed that they are still bearing the trauma they experienced in Myanmar. In outer New Zealand, maximum Rohingya people come in refugee quota, and they have been taken mainly from Malaysia, also from Myanmar and Thailand. But I could have the opportunity to take experiences of the Rohingya refugees coming mainly from Malaysia. If we think about the trauma of the global south, then there are various forms of trauma among the people of global south. For example, historical trauma and group trauma due to colonization, intergenerational or transgenerational trauma due to genocide, violence, persecution, etc. And we found there are a group of people in the Global South, as I mentioned, Rohingya people, and the Palestinian people, Jammu Kashmir people, Uyghur people, and also, I am coming from Bangladesh, that the Bihari people who are living in Bangladesh after its independence, that is from 1970 on, and they are also the most traumatized 
group of the global south. And if you think about the, or the interplay between method and trauma in global south, then it is observed that first we think about the colonization. And due to colonialism, because the colonial power blend out the resources and heritage of the colonial area, they crush the spirit of the people, deny the rights and privileges of the people of the colonies, and use the colonial area as the captive market for their resources and services. And due to the long history of colonialism, the people of Global South have had the collective trauma. And again, after colonization, then the power also work as due to the formation of trauma among the Global South people. The violent and traumatic oppressive and divide and rule foundation that were laid by colonialism power became the further interest through the power of the Global South. If we look at the Rohingya crisis of Myanmar, then it is very much obvious that how power can make a community stateless and that create collective trauma. And you know, Rohingya refugees are the largest stateless community of the world. And I think due to the power, they are now stateless people of the world. And again, power is constantly exercised through discourses of development. Power and development both are against the Rohingya people. The Rakhine state where the Rohingya people were living for centuries, but they are now expelled out from their area because I think the economic development that is going on in the Rakhine state and the development mainly now performed by China and India. And if you consider the China and India, we found that China and India generally, they are not agree in, in on concept, but they are, but in case of Rohingya crisis, they are, thus, they are, they are on the same pace because, because of the development that is going on in the Rakhine state. And also why the South, global South people living in trauma, I, again, we can think about the slavery and also the modern slavery because the slavery and human trafficking are crimes referred to the exploitative situations where an individual cannot refuse or leave due to threats, coercion, or abuse of power. And in case of modern slavery, if we think about the modern slavery, the most people from Bangladesh and the southern part of the world, they are taken by the Middle East country as a household or car. And they are getting the most trauma when they are working in the Middle East area. And more than 3.16 million domestic workers work in the Middle East. And only from Bangladesh, the figure is more than 200,000 women workers, they are working in the Middle East area. And all of them are maximum, every year Bangladesh gets women workers from the Middle East and they are coming with, their, with the trauma. And if we think about the violence and persecutions, then again, due to violence, persecution, conflict, and human rights violation, Global South countries hosted more than 85% of the world's Force the displaced people. In Global South, the people who experienced the most traumatic events for the last 50 years, as I mentioned, that the Rohingya people, and they are now staying in Bangladesh. More than 1.2 billion Rohingya people are now living in Bangladesh, and they are they, are, they all are in most traumatized condition. And if we consider the Rohingya people, they are stateless and they, even they do not have any identity. Even they do not have the identity of refugee. In Bangladesh, Bangladesh do not consider them as a refugees, but Bangladesh consider them as a forcibly displaced Myanmar national. And another things why Global South people are get traumatized because of climate change and global warming. Though the Global South countries are not responsible for global warming or climate change, but the effect is mainly on the Global South countries. Here I should give a data that Global North is responsible for 92% of excess emission. And among 92%, USA is responsible for 40% climate breakdown and 29% is done by European Union countries. But effect is going on to the Global South countries. And due to this global warming and climate change, there is also refugee people are formed and there is also a term that is climate refugees. And these refugees are also traumatized people.
And last but not the least, I should mention the COVID-19 pandemic that has, that has created a traumatic experience in the global south. And you, we all know that COVID-19 has already caused more than 3 million deaths worldwide, and now its epicenter is in the global south. And that also created trauma among the global south people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, uh, Mahapurpur. Um, uh, Dia? Okay. Um, first of all, thank you uh, from Mohan and Kara team for organizing this wonderful event and for inviting me to join this um, great panel. Um, so um, last night when I think about the prompts, um, I come into, uh, I, I found that Indonesia officially rejected the responsibility to protect or R2P, an international agreement to stop genocide, ethnic cleansing and other crimes. And I got reminded of the importance of the CARE project that uh, we did back in 2015. So the trauma project brought us closer to groups of community of survivors of the 90s that followed the attempted uh, military coup by the Indonesian Communist Party on the 30th of September, 1965. To date, after more than a half of century, the dominant narrative surrounding the event consists of highly virulent anti-communism propaganda, inspiring gravely discriminatory actions towards alleged communists and ex-prisoners, as well as their families and descendants. These historical and present experiences of violence manifest as situational, cumulative, and transgenerational trauma with profound impacts on health and well-being. To date, government, military, nationalist, and anti-communist groups have constantly warned public on the discreet attempts by communists to launch a revolution and reminded citizens to steer clear of communism or risk imprisonment. There is a clear present danger there when you're doing works on this issue. And coming from from a generation of Indonesian that was born long after the event, I consider myself as both insider and outsider in this research. There is an anxiety involved and also issue of trust. What do we know about these community members? What do we know about their sufferings, their struggle? What do you know about us is a question that to me as a researcher reflects the way communities see me and determine my status vis-a-vis -vis them. The outsider versus the insider. And this is exactly how Indonesian government and Indonesians position the 1965 community members as us versus them. Methods in this context should be addressed to re-examine and to disrupt this binary opposition of good versus evil, the killers versus the victims, the nationalists versus the communists, that circles around the 1965 event. So before we did the project, we, we took time to consider how should we approach the issue. Participants did express their concern on how researchers coming to talk to them, declaring that they know much about the event and that they have so much experience working on the issues. They came with some sort of a prescribed direction on how the research should be and what the community should do. This, positioning the community merely as objects of their study instead of making their voices heard. Therefore, the quick question, the key questions when, when talking about method and trauma in the global south would be how we can foster genuine listening, build empathy and humanize our participants, allowing them to take their agency. This is also the, the main point that, that the previous panel uh, speakers uh, emphasized in their talks whether the research will only confirm what is already known, confirming to the political mainstream, or whether they go beyond that, giving a, uh, giving a voice to both those that possess no voice and those that have been silenced. So instead of taking psychological, psychiatric, or literally theories of trauma as our starting point, uh, our work explore the meanings of trauma, survival and healing that are both implicitly and explicitly central to these ideas and activities through long-term dialogue and discussion with the members of the community. So locating the history 
as an opportunity to learn as a human, as a scholar and a citizen. Thank you. Wow, so many powerful ideas there, um, uh, Dia, Mahbubur, and Francine. Let me sort of uh, summarize some of these ideas before we move on to the uh, next prompt. Uh, so um, Francine, you talked about um, uh, sort of, you know, when working with um, uh, trauma, attending to processes of marginalization that create new forms of trauma and new forms of re-traumatization. And particularly within the context, um, attend to the ways in which silences and erasures of voices are created within dominant systems, even within the context of uh, working with um, uh, violence, right? Perpetrated often by um, <clears throat> organizations, by NGOs who participate in processes of gaslighting that erase community capacity by uh, failing to recognize uh, the agentic capacity of community. So, um, uh, it is within that context, then, you invite us to think through this question of method as how do we disrupt uh, these silences to build spaces for voices of communities. Um, Mahbubur, you talked about um, the Rohingya context where you have done uh, much of your work and how we need to think through the question of trauma uh, within the um, uh, sort of broader historical context looking at the historical processes, uh, connecting um, experiences of trauma to colonization, colonial power structures, and the uh, long processes of colonization that actually have inflicted this trauma, connected to land and occupation of land. Um, and, and then sort of um, inviting us to look at this from um, an intergenerational context of how that uh, trauma then is passed down. Uh, reflecting those processes of colonization. Um, and then you connected this powerfully to ongoing processes of traumatization under development. And, you know, we go back to China and India, two countries that we began uh, today's morning session with that actually are at the heart of the development projects on the Rakhine uh, state um, and are complicit in this process of um, uh, the genocide that is ongoing uh, with the Rohingya. And then you talked about, you know, the importance of um, attending to uh, the, uh, the ways in which trauma is constituted within the logics of neoliberal capital and the production of the precariat, like the movement of um, uh, women uh, workers as domestic workers into the Middle East and the context of modern slavery and the ways in which that produces trauma. And then uh, you finally wrapped us this up by talking about the climate change and uh, COVID context and how uh, these contexts produce new forms of traumatization. Uh, the, uh, your powerful work with the um, uh, 1965 project, uh, working with survivors of that uh, genocide uh, foregrounds this notion of, again, intergenerational um, erasure and how that uh, connects with particular forms of storytelling. And you attend to the uh, work of addressing that trauma by actually opening up the space to tell different kinds of stories and of um, and listening to different kinds of stories. You then talk about method as a way for uh, dismantling the binaries that have been perpetuated uh, by state propaganda, um, complicit with uh, uh, capital and um, uh, sort of the new colonial imperial formations. And within that context, then you ask, how do we foster spaces of listening, uh, spaces of listening that are the antithesis of the extractive relationships that researchers often bring when they engage with communities experiencing genocide. And then, you know, within that context, you share the work of the care um, uh, uh, interventions that emerge from within um, those communities of survivors uh, where the sort of anchoring uh, uh, agency in the voices of community members become opportunities for telling different kinds of stories focused on the meanings of trauma and building spaces for dialogue. So I'm going to uh, build on that and go to the next question, <clears throat> which is about the nature of method. And Mahbubu, we will start with you, then go to you, Dia, and then to you, Francine. And this question is, what is the nature of method then when working with trauma in Global South? Thank you, Professor. 
if we think about the nature of methods when you're working with the trauma in the global south people, so generally the research methodology is like interviews, observations are used as method working with the traumatized people. So an overarching precaution on safety of the emotions of the people is a must when taking the experiences of the people of the global south. In care, we are utilizing the culture center approach. And you know, culture center approach is a meta theoretical framework that is designed by Professor Mohan Dotto in his work with vulnerable and marginalized communities with trauma in various countries. It is an approach that centers culture by ensuring that community has voice in defining problems and solutions and provides resources and structural change and encourages reflexivity of the research team. Here in care, we're utilizing CCA where in-depth interviews have been taken by us. So I should just mention some of my experiences in the, the taking interviews of the trauma people of the, that is Rohingya people who are residing in Palmi. For taking in-depth interview, we are taking helping from the, uh, we, we should say that this community researcher and community researcher are the people who are the representatives of the marginalized community, that is the traumatized community. And we generally take interviews at a place that is safe for both the participants and the researcher. Here in Autora, New Zealand, we try to follow the cultures of the traumatized community. For example, if we, if we entered to their houses to take their interviews, then we use the gettings that is customized with, with that community. And before taking the experiences of the people, we generally take, we generally take some early description of the participants from the community researcher so that we could make ourselves to come to their level. Then with the help of our community researcher, we'll say purpose of our in-depth interviews that is in his experience that will be utilized for the research purpose only. And his and her identity will not be disclosed. Then the consent form is also given to the participant. And after, if he can sign, then he'll sign the consent form. And then we will start our interviews. And during interviews, there are some observations. There are some two emo emotional things may come in during our interviews. Then we also try to stop our interview and minimize that the situations. And during our interview, I observed that the Rohingya people mentioned that, that they are bound to leave their country due to the persecutions and persecutions and violence against them. And even I met some of the Rohingya people, they left Myanmar the, just by using the wooden board, risking their lives. And they have, they have the trauma like that. And even there, when we take their interview, they start just crying so that they, they have had to leave their motherland. So this type of trauma, we should minimize when we take interview of the people of the Myanmar, that is the Rohingya people. And at, in care, we are not using the Western method, methodologies. We are using the culture sensitive methodologies. We believe community is the best solver for any problem. And, and we also believe power should be given to the community to solve their problem. And, Always we think about the respect of that community so that we can get understanding of them and we can get their experiences in a, in a, in a sensitive way so that they, their emotion will, will not be, their emotions need, need to be taken by us. So always the emotions of the participants are encountered in the CCA approach and mainly the CC approach, we think the participants should be given priority and we are just using the open-ended questions so that both participants and researchers, we can involve in the process. And that's methodology we are using the, uh, to take interviews of the traumatized people in here. Thanks, Mahbubur. Dia. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's very interesting, uh, Mahbubur. Um, that exactly, uh, so I'm taking uh, from, from Mahbubur's um, uh, explanation to uh, 
to uh, to explain what we did uh, with the with the 1965 project. So participants in our trauma study, they have been excluded from the dominant narratives of the 1965 for more than half of a century. So they've been cast aside and forgotten. As a matter of fact, they were forced to forget who they are, their presence and roles in society to the extent that they could no longer identify themselves as humans. So there is historic memory involved. And to date, research on historical trauma, while able to account for culture, agency, and lived experience of the victims, have often looked at the way data can be generated, presented, and interpreted, especially how the researchers can engage with the data and co-produce alternative knowledge. Participants' active involvement throughout the research uh, process uh, in this particular study is the key approach that we utilized. So we have advocacy group that involve in the process, in the research process since the very beginning to work together with us to determine where we're going, uh, what kind of questions we're going to um, uh, develop uh, for the interviews and so on. So largely missing from the discursive spaces devoted to trauma study, um, trauma recognition and healing are initiatives by groups of traumatized people who develop participatory initiatives. Uh, activities that do not rely on the assistance of mental health professionals and on psychological or psychiatric theories concerning the nature of trauma. So it is becoming increasingly important for researchers as we go along to critically reflect on approaches that have a positive impact on the well-being of the community members that we are working with. So such issues are of great importance and perhaps of special relevance to researchers in the Global South and to the Indonesian context in which we work. When the community members become the researchers and, part, and actively involved in the process and not merely the research, the activity of research is transformed. Questions are framed differently, priorities are ranked differently, problems are defined differently and people participate on different terms locating um, the agency at the center of the research. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Pia. There is so much to um, reflect on with that. Uh, Francine. Excellent. Thank you, Dia. Um, so the CCA methodology builds communi um, communicative dialogue through in-depth interviews. Community researchers are used to um, carry out these interviews. These are people that live in the community, those, um, and take the interviews of those um, people. These interviews are then transcribed and coded and then narratives are pulled out, um, directly giving the voice of the community. So no adaption is made. Um, the CCA process reaches the voice of the community at the margins of the margins. This brings the question to mind as well, as Dr. Debelina Dutta spoke about earlier, and who is this research for, the academics or the communities? So we can often see through our work here um, that we're carrying out at the moment that many people like to have their pockets lined. So the CCA approach is all about giving to the community and support them, that is supported by the CCA methodology. Um, honouring community and reducing the intergenerational trauma that goes through with um, giving an interview or having trauma inflicted upon them. Um, the work undertaken by CARE on sexual and family violence research shows how maintaining an authentic community voice from the field requires constant negotiation and reflection by our research team to ensure that their voice is coming through and is not washed out or minimized in any way. As researchers, we are aware of our positions of power if we are undertaking any interviews. So we create spaces that are comfortable for the participants to ensure their authentic voice comes through in the research. Such spaces may be taking interviews in gardens or in homes. Through listening to the voice at the margins of the margins of society, empowerment is given, not erased. This concept that Ida Matu spoke about in our first panel this morning, um, 
as as brought through here in our work also and she spoke about women in the congo where they've experienced trauma but that experience of trauma creates that solidarity and where they can begin to find a place of strength um, we're finding that also with our work here and creating solutions to sexual and family violence um, where people can create their own language for peace and strength as Ida Matu spoke this morning. So women here in New Zealand uh, find solidarity working together building um, solutions um, to sexual and family violence. The CCA process of listening to voice with humility empowers the margins of society to identify the solutions and in the context of their lived environment, not how somebody else may see it for them. Too often solutions are developed with a top-down governmental approach, not applicable to the margins of society and do not reach the lived experience of communities at the margins and therefore reinforce the trauma experienced in the Global South. Thank you. Well, there is uh, so much um, right here uh, to process and um, think through. And I think uh, one of the uh, questions that emerges across um, um, all three of your conversations really is how do you build uh, registers um, uh, methodologically for those that are experiencing trauma to hold control over the research method, isn't it? Mm -hmm. that, that really seems to be the, the real question. Uh, how do uh, communities at the margins of the margins who have been experiencing this trauma um, hold control over uh, the processes of research so that uh, they can actually determine the objectives, the frameworks in their own terms. Uh, so Dia, you talked about embedding this within advocacy networks and working uh, through those networks. Um, I also go back to a point that uh, Pradeep made in the earlier presentation, yeah. which is what happens in very marginalized contexts where communities are not organized. So there, I think the question of method becomes one of community building and mobilizing and that critical literacy that you was talking about so that you can create that register for communities to own the research method in their own terms. Um, so I want to build from that to go into sort of the third prompt and hopefully that will then leave us enough time to go into a broader conversation with our audience. So the third prompt, we will start with you, Dia. And that question is, what are the methodological imperatives that emerge from contexts of working with trauma in the Global South? Okay, thank you, Brahmohan. So our CCA care project on trauma and violence centers on understanding the context in which people tell that is experienced and recognizing how this intersects with structural violence, inequity, and trauma. Uh, of course, this is distinct from Western notions of trauma that center on individuals' experience of traumatic events, which has been critiqued as a reductionist lens that does not adequately encompass the community of 1965 uh, survivors' experiences of trauma and violence. When researching trauma, uh, the researcher or myself uh, act as a member of both a scholarly community and a human community. Therefore, crucial in this uh, way of thinking is exercising critical reflectivity. In communities that are marginalized, there are elements that you can build upon to create a healing pathway. It requires critical thinking about why things are the way they are and the role of systems in creating current inequities. While understanding the influence of trauma is critical, researchers, uh, based on our experience, also need to build collective strength, being mindful not to look at communities through a deficit-based lens. And this is why it is crucial, as Prof. Mohan said, to involve communities um, uh, to let them uh, uh, participate actively in the process, uh, in the research process. If this type of reflection is not thought um, in, in formal places, in my opinion, we will always be trying to do something to a community as opposed to working and aligning ourselves with communities to build something they want, something um, that fits their spirit. 
Um, this is actually the main question that one of the participants uh, asked me during the first um, interview. What do you know about us? So if the, if the community takes ownership of their journey of this work, they will figure out how to make that happen. In this project, we learned that if you're able to create those spaces where people recognize they have ideas and role to play, irrespective of what others may say, that's where healing begins to take root. We, um, we argue that participatory and transformative research methods, which recognize individual and communities' assets, are needed. For the participants in our, in our project, uh, for example, singing and staging theatrical performance are forms of everyday resistance. Um, the initiatives to articulate the, the trauma, both within the groups and publicly, come from the community. So I'm referring as well to what Francine um, said that maintaining authentic community voice there, the solutions and voices. Thank you. Yeah, back to you, Prof Mohan. Yeah, uh, Francine. Thank you. Um, for the, um, our work here at Kia shows us that community do actually have a voice. Um, they have solutions and they have the ability to implement these solutions and to work through the development of each stage um, with community, with people that they trust. Um, through dialogue, we've identified that community trauma continues as well for people through the marginalisation of their voice and by structures silencing those that voice of the people. Um, an example has emerged um, through the rainbow community, specifically for trans people, where they um, want the ability to be at the table, to have their voice heard and not be lumped in with other groups as well. Um, to speak in circles that matter and not be spoken for. Another example is emerged by Māori participants, specifically in our aged and disabled groups, um, where they state Tariti, um, the treaty here in New Zealand and Aotearoa, is still not being honoured in its entirety and so continues to erase the voice of these people and marginalises them further. Um, and this requires them then to constantly be fighting for these equal rights, equal voice and equal seats at the table. Through the CCA methodology, listening to community and voice, we found power struggles have emerged as well. Um, attempts at silencing voice and unwillingness to adopt frameworks for solutions that have come by sector stakeholders really really interesting people that state they're there for the community they want to help the community but they constantly undermine the community and use uh, phrases such as community uh, creating solutions is dangerous so this um, delegitimizing um, community voice and empowerment just goes against everything the cca is about um, just creates trauma just constantly so you've got this constant battle that we're, we're going through with our research and work. Um, I've seen firsthand as well the trauma inflicted by community members on, um, sorry, on the community members by the sector stakeholders. Um, I sort of call them like wolf in sheep's clothing um, comes to mind as where they single-handedly undermine the process of the CCA and they then suck in other stakeholders um, to create their own power and lift themselves, but just destroys community efforts. This action by the stakeholders is just outright dangerous, um, undermines community agency to their empowerment um, and highlights the imperative need to be constantly reflecting on the process and for researchers to be pushing back at each stage of the research, especially us here at CARE, to ensure that the CCA methods are not being undermined and the community voice is not being erased. So the behaviour of these stakeholders, these people with positions of power, continue to inflict trauma and this needs to be acknowledged and owned by these stakeholders. Without this, they will not be able to let go 
and support community um, to the solutions of sexual and family violence that the community themselves have been able to create. So if we don't um, see the ownership and acknowledgement by sector stakeholders, then we'll see this constant cycle of victim perpetration continuing. Um, and then this, for, this therefore enables the positions of power to these stakeholders. So we found that creating spaces um, for community reinforces their agency and gives them empowerment. Thank you. Thank you, Papa Singh. Mabu. <clears throat> so it is obvious that trauma is very much common for the colonized people of the global south. And to take their experiences, collaborative and participatory methods are very much useful. And in CCA, we are trying to utilize the collaborative approach that it we are, that is very utilizing open-ended questions when you are taking the experiences of the participant. And we are trying to listen the voice of the participant, what they, are, what they want to say, what they want to express themselves that we are trying to say. And if we think about the traumatized people of the Rohingya people, they are continuously traumatized and they are living with, without any identity for last four decades. And I am just taking that experiences here in New Zealand. And they mentioned that they are still traumatized. And I also found some women participants who also left their country just by using the wooden boat. And you, you can think, you can imagine just left their country using using a boat, risking their life. And also she is a female. So she's is so much traumatized just leaving the country and then living in another country and at last they are getting the chance to get in refugee quota and staying in New Zealand. So this, this it is very difficult to get the experience of this type of trauma having you know, the people of the Rohingya people. But we are trying to take their interview in a that's utilizing the culture center approach because culture center approach believe the believe that the community communities are the main focal point to solve their any crisis to solve their trauma or even even any any problem they can solve it and even they mention, mention that in our when we live in our country we have the union political system that is you know any problem arise we go to the people that, that is community leader and that that is very much absent in out there in new zealand and they are, they are also think talking about it, when you are talking the interviews that talking about the, about the about the structural barrier here they are facing even they do not know where should they go where where should they if they face any problem like family or sexual violence where sh should they go by whom should they talk even they do not know so this type of experiences we are getting from the traumatized people who are living in out uh, New Zealand. And in culture center approach, we always try to keep our bodies online. And I, I should mention the last discussion, that is we are trying to take the lived experiences of the communities and we should try to understand their context. And we should try to respect the communities, listening to the communities. And because every communities are different, that Asha, Asha mentions, there is last talk that culture is community and community is culture that we should believe when you are taking the experiences of the traumatized people. Thank you. Wow. There is just uh, so much um, uh, amazing um, insights here. I want to quickly summarize before opening up the space for our audience to ask any questions. So uh, Dia, you talked about the importance of understanding the context for grounding the structural violence and really starting to dismantle the individualization, um, the individual blame that happens in the trauma literature and particularly in the reductionist psychologiz psychologization in the trauma literature, right? And instead to look at 
the processes of um, uh, colonization, the processes of um, um, uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, within the context of uh, 1965, uh, the processes of the Cold War and the politics of the Cold War and the ways in which uh, that shaped overarchingly uh, these structures of violence. You also talked about um, um, what does it mean to not, as researchers, to not do something to community, but rather to imagine what does it mean to do with community alongside um, uh, community and what does it mean then um, in terms of building spaces, ideas, rules, that emerged from within the lived experiences and lived struggles of communities. So you talked about participatory methods being transformative and particularly with the 1965 work, the example of singing and uh, staging theatrical projects as healing, uh, they are powerful because that, that those are instances where communities take ownership and that ownership is part of dismantling the erasures and the silences that have been perpetuated by the uh, propaganda machines of the hegemonic structures. And it is in that process then uh, you build that um, infrastructure for authentic voice and really ask that question, what does it mean to uh, create, maintain, sustain authentic uh, community voice? Francine, um, you beautifully talked about this notion that uh, when method emerges from within communities in the global south, communities own these methods. Uh, they clear that they clearly have solutions uh, to the ongoing challenges of sexual violence and family violence is very clear yeah. that they have the knowledge and they have um, inbuilt ways of understanding power. Uh, critically analyzing power and dismantling it is very clear. But what is also clear is the ways in which um, uh, uh, these capacities are silenced by existing power configurations mm -hmm. in society, including the relationship between uh, the sector, the non-government organizations, mm -hmm. and the state that funds these non-governmental organizations. Mm -hmm. So often, because what you're saying is that for these NGOs, uh, this becomes a politics of economics. It, mm -hmm. it becomes the cash machinery. That's how they survive. Mm -hmm. So they too participate in this oppressive way of silencing community solutions. Mm -hmm. And when communities do in fact come up with solutions that threatens the power of the NGOs, right? Which is why there is this constant uh, delegitimization which we have to battle against, right? So um, you, as you rightly point out, a lot of our work then focuses on uh, this question of how do we push back the structures? And that means that pushing back against uh, the NGOs and their uh, delegitimizing narrative we have seen instances where, you know, to talk about, we talk about infrastructure of listening, uh, to actually discuss that with NGOs threatens them. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want to be told that we need to build a methodology of listening, uh, because that is threatening to uh, their identities and political economy. Um, it's, it's so within that context, you say that it needs to be acknowledged that NGOs within that hegemonic framework perpetuate violence. Yeah. And that's the central point of the methodology, because it's only by acknowledging that can we build spaces for uh, community voices, you know. And then, Mabu, we talk about um, uh, this, again, this notion of recognizing that trauma is a continual process. So for Rohingya, for instance, they are continually traumatized. The experience of colonization, xenophobia, and expulsion is not something you can bracket, but that actually continues to fill into and come into these spaces here in El Teruwa, for instance. Um, you talk about uh, this notion of the, the need to recognize the impossibilities of listening that even as we talk about listening, we must recognize that listening is impossible, isn't it? And that becomes um, a powerful lesson in human humility. You also talk about this, again, this emphasis on structural barriers, you know, like uh, communities saying that when they experience sexual violence and family violence, they don't know where to go to, yeah. whom to go to. And that kind of fundamental communicative violence is part of their lived experiences. So from there, then you come back to this question of how do we build listening and frameworks of listening to communities recognizing that, um, you know, what Asha was saying earlier, that culture is community and community is culture. 
is that a, a, a decent summary of uh, the beautiful uh, things that you have to say? We think so. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful, Mohan. Thank you. Let Let's go to our audience um, uh, for any questions, and then we can come back uh, to you again. Priyanka, please. Uh, hi. Um, uh, first of all. Um, it's really heartening to know that in-depth interviews and listening is such an important methodology uh, in care uh, because I'm from India and here somehow in our academic environments, too much emphasis is placed on numbers, number of interviews and number of respondents. And not that it is incorrect to do so. Uh, it's just that it just undermines the dimensions and the personalities and emotions and the feelings that respondents or the research subjects uh, bring uh, to the bring to the study which is which I think is so important and uh, thank you for reinforcing that in my mind and um, secondly I have two questions um, is there a is there a specific number of interviews that need to be conducted in order for uh, research to be more reliable? Is there anything like that? Um, because I'm unaware of it. Who wants to respond to that? Well, yeah, I can respond to that. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, so, um, if you read um, qualitative text, text, uh, text or methodology textbook, there is no specific number of how many interviews you should, you should do uh, in order to produce rich insights because it depends again on your willingness to unpack your knowledge when you're conducting the interviews. Uh, well, some textbook will say around 30. Um, the other textbook will say like, you probably should do 60. So uh, again, it depends on, on, on what 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 is the um uh how you're going to uh, how your research is going to progress what are your research questions and and of course the um the epistemology that 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 become the background of your study so in this case uh, in my experience of conducting uh, care research um we always we constantly going back and forth to what we uh, what we did in, 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 in developing our, our research proposals, looking at the research questions. And then uh, it's a constant process rather than determining how many participants you should interview at the beginning of your study. I think that would be something that um, come in uh, as, as, as a re in response to your questions for me. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, um, um, Debolina wanted to respond to your uh, question, I think, a little bit. Go ahead, Debo. Okay, I'm, you know, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can. Yes, I can. Okay, I'm coming from the point of view that um, I've, you know, I've done research in academia a while ago, and uh, more recently I've done research across different contexts. 30 is a decent number. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Having said that, there's a couple of other things to be said. One is that you know, one of the factors that we often overlook in research is that research is bound by the resources that you have available to you, right? Yeah. And yeah. yeah, so you may want to do a certain amount of research, but you may not be able to do that because yeah. of research that's in Spain uh, that's around you. Okay. The, the second idea I find very useful in, in, in such a question is the idea of saturation. Right? Okay. Yeah, so you're on the field, you will start hearing similar sorts of things in similar sorts of areas. And you push beyond that because it's not just hearing those things in, from different places. It's also sort of being able to um, tease out the complexity of those ideas. And yeah. when you reach a sort of saturation along each of those trajectories of complexity, I would okay. say you're done with your interview. That, okay. that, but that's me. And you know this is this is a panel of of like serious experts in the field, but yeah, that's what I. 
Okay. You okay. Know, uh, I... Priyanka, can I just add to that? I think it's beautiful what uh, uh, Bia and uh, Debo suggested. I want to also build on that and say that it really depends upon what you're trying to do and what is your context and going back to the community and the lived experience, what does that lived experience guide you to? So you can have an excellent study with an interview of one participant. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And uh, that will be a narrative, a story you're trying to construct with that participant, trying to understand the phenomenon. Now, yeah. with the work of care, because we are also, as we are doing, our method is a way for mobilizing and organizing communities, right? So as yeah. we are trying to do this, we also have to think about what is the number that will actually give us enough of a community base for a community to be organized around an idea or a concept. So when, say, for instance, working with um, uh, transgender sex workers, uh, that yeah. interviewing method becomes a way for us to build a base of <laughs> transgender sex worker advocacy, right? Yeah. So uh, in that context, we want to do um, as many interviews as possible because we are widening the base. You see what I'm saying? And uh, yeah. then again, when we are engaging with policy structure, because we want some policy change, for instance, uh, then uh, having a robust number of interviews might be really important uh, if we have the resources <laughs> like what they're both saying. Because just like what you're saying, Priyanka, policymakers will come at us and say, you don't have enough interviews, you don't have enough diversity of interviews, uh, those are not uh, substantive numbers. So then yeah. we have to sort of anticipate that response and prepare for it. So really your context and your purpose is important. And for us, <laughs> often it is our communities and our community advisory groups that sort of hold this uh, decision making in their hands. Yeah, okay. Okay, yes, I think that that perfectly, I think um, answers my question actually. Um, another question that I have is, um, um, the context for my question is that I work with, uh, I mean, my doctorate thesis work has been uh, with a marginalized section in a in a hilly state of India. Um, what I want to ask you is that what are the features of a disorganized community? Because that's a term that I came across uh, while uh, the panelist was speaking. How do I distinguish between organized and disorganized communities? <clears throat> Great question. Uh, does any of you want to respond to that? I think you should respond to that, Prof. Yeah. I mean, I'm happy to respond to that. I think uh, that that's a great way to actually think through your fieldwork. So, uh, 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 disorganized, or you might say an unorganized community, is yes. a sort of a community context where uh, the community has not yet crystallized or congealed around an identity based on which it is advocating for structural transformation or advocating for changes in structures. Um, and within that context, then um, uh, sort of an organized community is a community that has come <laughs> around an idea, an identity, and through that identity it is able to lay particular kinds of demands and claims on the structure. Now, of course, you know, for many communities, it is not just um, uh, a binary, uh, it unorganized versus organized, but rather it might be a continuum and you might have uh, uh, sort of both unorganized and organized within the same spaces. So let me give you an example of our work with domestic workers. So, um, you know, the work that we have done with foreign domestic workers in <laughs> Singapore or um, actually in uh, Noida in India, uh, that um, a large part of the domestic work sector is, one would say, unorganized, right? So they're yeah. not organized into unions, they're not organized into collectives. Um, at the same time, the process of doing the culture-centered work 
with domestic workers as we build their advisory groups becomes a way for organizing uh, into these advisory groups, which become collectives for raising mm -hmm. demands of the state and really working uh, like unions or uh, proto unions, if you will, um, uh, in some ways. But even if you think about domestic work, and I give you the context of India, you might say that it's an unorganized sector, which is where you have a, a, the precarity and it's a precariat. Yeah. And yet at the same time, we have multiple um, initiatives of movements led by domestic workers that are in different forms in different contexts. So that's what I mean by uh, this notion that it is also a fluid space, you know? Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, um, thank you so much, yes. Debu, did you want to add to that? I see you no, nodding. No. I, I nod a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I probably want to add uh, just a just a little bit. Yeah, I think yeah. it's very interesting, uh, Prof Mohan, uh, what you said about organized and disorganized. This is a very fluid concept, right? This is something that you 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 can develop based on your experience in the field. Uh, so in a, in the case of 1965, uh, survivors, for example, people will think that they are a disorganized community because they simply have no access to to this to to the structure. Um, they have to remain silent in order to to um to to access their rights as a citizen uh, as human but on the other hand as a, as a community members because of this oppression they found themselves um, uh, united in a small collective uh, uh, organizations that that mm. uh, they established to actually um, to voice their concerns um, mm. in a way that uh, the government will never suspect uh, as, 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 as being a communist uh, activity. So this is something that I think uh, I found during the, 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 my research. So on one, at one hand, this community is, 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 is very disorganized because uh, there being a, a, an outsider, a different group in, in the country, they call the country uh, Indonesia. But then on the other hand, as, as, a, as a community of survivors, they're, they're able to organize themselves in a small group and they're trying to access um, their necessities. Uh, they're trying to access their rights. They're trying to voice their concerns in a, in a ways that, that suit their, uh, their community. So they suit their needs. So that's my experience of working with the 65. So, you probably will be able to determine this um, along the way as you're working on your research and have okay. found your, your unique characteristic um, of the community that you're working on. Okay. Yeah, what a powerful example of the 1965 uh, uh, survivors because also the context is so um, uh, dangerous for yes, uh, yes. the community to come together and organize that the organizing also needs to happen in a way that it is not legible, legible to outsiders or to the structure. Exactly, yeah. Yes, exactly. Of course. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Um, Alankar, you had a question. Please go for it. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, I belong to uh, Assam uh, in India. And uh, I was just wondering about uh, the how do we deal with the fatigueness the fatigue that the communities face while answering questions to number of people that they visit, uh, where the visit itself becomes a trauma for them in future. For example, mm. I'll tell you, uh, there's this whole uh, episode of 1983 in the Nelly violence, uh, where more than uh, 3,000 uh, uh, minorities, the Muslim minorities were being killed in Assam. I think some of you might know about this incident and there are a couple of work that has been done by Makiko Kimura uh, who has written a book on Nelly violence and, and my PhD thesis itself is on that but my work is not on the communities but on how the regional uh, press of Assam actually took a different uh, step and, and how did they silence the voice. So my work is mostly on the archival newspapers and stuff like that. But the whole orientation has changed uh, uh, for me now when I want to work with these communities to understand where are these women and children of 1983 placed today and how are, are they actually being traumatized even today? Now, the problem that I'm going to cite here is that when you visit this kind of sites, I mean, they are overburdened with number of questions from different people 
like from students from Tata Institute of Social Science, students from Guwahati University, students from you know different universities, and uh, it has become a research laboratory for the people. So uh, they sometimes do not want to uh, you know you know answer those questions because that that reminded them of some kind of a, a terrific horror stories that have happened on that uh, on that uh, unfortunate day uh, on February 18, 1983. So how do how should we deal with this kind of a situation when the things are very sensitive uh, and 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 being from a majority majoritarian community being a Hindu being an indigenous Assamese uh, how how do I actually should deal with this kind of a situation I mean this is just a thought I mean you may respond to it thank you. I just want to say what an awesome, awesome, awesome um, uh, uh, contribution. Uh, just powerful. And, and we see this a lot in our work. Um, any of you want to address it? Yeah, I'd like to um, comment on that. Um, what we find with the interviews that we've been conducting um, with participants here in Aotearoa around sexual and family violence is continuing on that dialogue and checking back in with um, the participants after the interviews are conducted, offering them services that may be available that we know are safe and yeah. they're happy yeah. to go to. Um, also, we, through, through the interview process, like Professor Mohan was saying before, it, it's a facilitation process of um, creating advisory groups. So you're connecting people together that may not have been, um, may not have known about one another before. So you're creating allies through those interviews. Um, yeah, I mean, I do appreciate that. Yes, it would be fatiguing for people to be carrying out those interviews. And it is a re-traumatizing process. Um, no doubt, I'm very well aware of that. Yeah, thank you. That's yeah. If you want to carry on. Thank with, you, Francine. Yeah. I just want to add to that a little bit and and say that um, Alankar, you know what important and powerful yeah. work you know kudos to you for doing this, particularly being majoritarian Assamese. Um, yeah, they, they have a responsibility to actually uh, interrogate the violence that is perpetuated by the majoritarian culture, especially in India today. And I think Assam is at the forefront of this because of the ways in which uh, xenophobia has been organized in Assam. So um, kudos to you. Um, uh, you know, I want to just bring up uh, th three things that mm -hmm. connect with uh, what Francine was saying. So for us, you know, the, the, the first element is really building community spaces. And part of that is recognizing community fatigue. So because of the notion of telling and retelling a story. So, uh, the, the, you know, we talk about building advisory groups, with, which are advisory groups of community members who decide what that process of research is going to look like. Um, and, and part of that often is actually staying away entirely from the narration of the trauma, at least to begin with, simply because they have narrated those stories of trauma so many times, and those stories have been extracted too often. So in fact, in the work that we are doing in Aotearoa right now, um, our interview protocol doesn't even touch upon personal experiences of trauma because uh, our advisory groups feel that we do not need to re-traumatize people, but rather we move towards how does the community perceive the kinds of solutions uh, that are structurally necessary. So we go directly toward the structures without actually going through the personalization and the individualization of the trauma. You know, um, I give that to you as one example, but then there are other instances where for the communities, it might be that the telling of the story and they want to tell us that story is a way because they trust us, um, is the way for dismantling the erasure that has taken place. Of course, again, foregrounding the structure and the violence perpetuated by that structure. And Dia, you can talk about our uh, 1965 work uh, within that context. But 
the one thing I want to um, also bring up within this is that when communities hold their power, and remember, you know, something Debelina had earlier said is that whom are we serving? So for us as care, it is very clear that uh, that orientation is to communities uh, with the idea that communities own the terms of that uh, conversation. And that also means that in terms of what we publish, how we publish, where we publish is often guided by communities. So uh, there are entire bodies of work that we have done that we haven't published anything out of or that we have waited to publish something out of. And it has gone to a point where it's the community that has now been telling us, hey, you really need to publish this. And then we know, okay, it's a good point to actually start doing this, isn't it, Dia, you know? Uh, uh, so it, it sort of is the other way around where the community sets the rhythm for us. Yeah. Can I add to that, Prof Mohan? Yes, yes. <clears throat> yes, so um, just taking from Prof Mohan's explanation. So, there was this, um, so this, um, I would like to answer this and thank you for the question. This is a very powerful question. I'm trying to honor one of our participants who passed away last month. And this actually this response comes from her. She's one of the, our um, advocacy uh, uh, team members. Uh, she was already in her 89 uh, years old when, when we did the interview. And this is her suggestion don't come to me, don't come to us asking about the trauma because you've read about it in in your te history textbooks. It's all over the place. It's even you can look at from, from our face, you can tell that, that the trauma is there. Ask me about my happiness, who I was before the 65, uh, what I did as a young woman uh, marching on the streets, um, uh, uh, advocacy, advocating for, for education equality for women. So she wants us to start by recognizing this happiness moment. That's, that's actually uh, the memory that, that was um, deleted from, from the history textbooks that, that she was trying to honor. And uh, through this question, um, we gained so much. So I, I, came, I came back to uh, and talked to our team and then we discussed and then we decided to modify the questions. We, do, we did not start uh, asked by asking, like Prof Mohan said, uh, anything related to the trauma, but we, we, we asked them about, about the memory that had been erased from, from, from the everyday conversations, from, from the discursive of, of 1965. So that's one way that uh, we learn as a researcher when we did the project, the CC8 project. Thank you. And, and so the, uh, what came out of that, and, and Alanka, this is a, a great example, what came out of that is that the women uh, scripted, co-scripted uh, a storyboard, uh, which became the basis of a documentary that we co-created with them, which is all about the erased memories. And that was the way for taking the power back for the women, you know? Yeah, that's, that's wonderful to know. I mean, and this is a new approach that today uh, you have brought out that ask me about my happiness. I mean, it's wonderful. Even I can now look forward to the children of uh, Nelly during that time. Probably they are now in their uh, early 30s or late 30s. Uh, probably somebody might join Indian Army. You never know from the from the mm. Seva or Seoul mm. villages. Uh, so, uh, so, so definitely it gives me a lot of uh, inspiration to go for another search after the pandemic is over. And look for those kind of characters, those kind of uh, people who are there and uh, working in the field and then, you know, interview them, bring their stories so that I'm not talking about collective amnesia, but of course, the eraser of that kind of uh, a trauma that they have gone through in their lives. And today, uh, you know, they may be play successful. I don't know where are they. So, uh, so thanks for this uh, inspirational note, uh, Professor Datta and your team. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, I want to um, go back to uh, the, the three of you and ask what you would like to add. I would just like to say thank you so much for this opportunity, my um, debut on camera. Mm -hmm my opportunity to speak and it's been lovely thank you 
I would like to say thank you all. And I would like to share one of my experience also about the fatigueness. Last year, I visited the Rohingya refugee camp mm -hmm. and some of the participants mentioned, just saying like that, they are coming and taking our interviews, but our situation is not improved. We are in the same scenario, just that the fatig fatigueness becomes a trauma. Then how could I manage the situation that I, I should tell? That is, uh, at the time, I do not know the concept of community researcher, but the person who is belong with me, that is, he's a journalist and he's very much close to the community. He just overcome the situation and I, I could take the interview. But, but, but there is more to it than that, Mahbubo, though, because you were working as a journalist at that yeah, point. Yeah. You also built that story that you gathered as the point of advocacy yeah. for advocating for the Rohingya, yeah. right? So it's not just taking a story, but it is also giving something back. Yeah. Because Rohingyas are telling people are coming to us, they're taking our interviews, interviews are shown to the media, but our situation is not improved. We are in the same scenario for the last three years or even more than 12 years in the same camp. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Dia. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Prof. Mohan. Um, I, want to, I want to close my, um, my presentation with a poem. I don't know if I can be that that expressive because the poem uh, is actually derived from our field work, from the field notes, from the um, from the transcripts. Um, I may not be as 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 it not, may not be as powerful as what it is in, in Indonesian language, but this is something that that I try to work as part of my um, reflection and something that um, that participants also uh, work together uh, with me. So. It's called, um, what's in the name? What's your name? Just call me Wu. Wu is a Japanese word to call um, a daughter. That's my name. Symbolizes love and affection, my grandma said. Yeah, but what's your name? Just call me Ndo. It's another Japanese word for, for a little girl. But that's not a name. You don't want to know my name. My name sets the night on fire burns your dreams into ashes. So what's your name? Irina, Olga, Svetlana, Tatiana. So these are wonderful memories. So that poem actually come from, from participants who were forced to erase their beautiful names because it related to Russian. And uh, if you have relation to Russia, uh, even today, until today, then they put your life in danger. So. In order to respect that memories, I draw from 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 the field note, from from the from the interview transcriptions, and write on this poem something that that makes me reflect. And I I count my blessing every day because I have my full name uh, that my father gave me, and, and um, I can use it even until today. Something that 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 these participants did not experience and losing their name, their given name is it really breaks their heart. That that's part of the trauma that that never is spoken. We we never read that in the history textbook. So thank you for this wonderful opportunity, Prof Mohan and everyone at CARE. Merci. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much, um, uh, Dia, for sharing that beautiful, uh, powerful, powerful poem, you know. Um, I just want to take this opportunity to thank each one of you and thank our audience for sticking with us throughout uh, the night and into the day. For some of you, I know you started uh, very, very early. So thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. And hopefully this is a way for us to build a space. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. And, and then we will see you uh, tomorrow again. Thank you.